Seven days is a long time in football. Who will blink first? Who will start the domino effect? And will Manchester United get a deal done? Welcome to Transfer Talk. Remember, you can tweet the show at Sky Sports News using the hashtag Transfer Talk. We're also recording another episode of the Transfer Talk podcast this afternoon. It's going to be out later tonight. Let's get to Manchester United. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is under pressure as he prepares his side to face Tranmere in the FA Cup. They're yet to make a signing in this transfer window. They are still trying for Bruno Fernandes. This is what Solskjaer had to say this morning. Jürgen spent four years building his team uh, and they're doing well now. So, of course, it's, I've said it so many times, it's not going to be a quick fix. But, and it's not going to be like eight players in or ten players in in one transfer window. We've had one transfer window, proper one, in the summer because the Januarys, they are difficult. And, but we are still trying to do something now. I trust them to be the, the good lads carrying us forward with some signings, of course, with players coming back from injuries. So you just don't, you don't just take the roof off when you're going to rebuild there or knock your house. You need to knock a house down and put the foundation in. You you just don't start with a roof. And for us, we've we've had a couple of rainy days, and we wish that roof was uh, on. So Ole Gunnar Solskjaer saying it was never going to be eight or ten players in during this transfer window. We know this is going to be a long process, which is what we've been saying since the start of this transfer window. Long process, just like that analogy from Ole Gunnar <laughs> yes. Solskjaer. Um, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is basically echoing the sentiments of Ed Woodward. Every time Manchester United release financial results, Ed Woodward speaks to investors. Uh, and he's said, look, this is going to take at least four windows to rebuild Manchester United to where people expect them to be. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, we, as our Manchester United reporter James Cooper's told us, isn't under any pressure because they seem to be on the same page, which is it's going to take, what, two years probably to get to the point people expect Manchester United to be at with the star names, with the you know, players coming through that they want and with a, with a system that screams Manchester United of days gone by. That's one of the reasons why Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's in the job. So that's the Manchester United side, but we can't argue with that. There is pressure there. No doubt. And th there was that analogy. You don't just take the roof off when you rebuild your house. You need to knock the house down and put in the foundations. This is what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has said today. Uh, you don't just start with the roof. For us, we've had a couple of rainy days and we wish that roof was on, but you can't hide. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, philosophical. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Mark, uh, Anton mentioned it there, the pressure is there to make signings. Absolutely. This is the problem for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Manchester United. They are under pressure to build a new side and challenge for the Premier League, and you cannot do both. You know, there was one person that was, that was the master of doing that, and that was Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, and you have to remember, every time he brought through young players into that Manchester United team, they were surrounded by great, experienced players. And I think it would be naive of any manager to think that they can just chuck a whole bunch of kids together and let them develop over time. Experienced players are crucial, not just for the now, but they're also crucial for developing youngsters. And that's what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has really got to get the balance right. You know, obviously you saw a change in philosophy over the course of the summer. Wan Bissaka coming in at right back, a young, promising, exciting player. Dan James again in a further forward position, again young, exciting, and promising. Um, and then Harry Maguire, slightly more experienced. It's important that you get that balance right, and it's those experienced players that help develop the youngsters. And I think that's a, a really key thing to remember. But isn't it funny how quickly things could change? Because back in summer, we were commending Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for bringing in these young players that had the youth and the, the determination and the talent. Wan Bissaka, Daniel James, Harry Maguire, and then you see a player like Ash. Young Go, who you know, the club captain, he's been there all those years, got all that experience. And as you say, you need that balance. And at the minute, they've just not got that. Daniel James, he has had a great season, but he's hardly been rested. There's been a lot of onus on him. Harry Maguire has had a lot to deal with as well. So, you know, these, these young players have come in and they haven't had the time to even just get to know the mould of the club. It's been right, get going, and that, from the get off, really. Yeah, we debated that Ashley Young deal quite a bit here on, on the programme. And in the end, it was Ashley Young that decided he wanted a clean break from Manchester United now rather than leaving in the summer. But they can't make signings for the sake of make, making signings. We saw Ole Gunnar Solskjaer say, we can't get eight or ten in yeah. now. They can't just 
bring players in just to fill the quantity, just to fill the numbers. Yeah, there's going to need to be a, a patience from everyone involved with United, and that, that goes to the fans as well. Um, it's going to take three or four windows, we know that. I mean, they probably be are probably looking at what Liverpool are doing and what Manchester City are doing. And he's right in that, in that grab there, he's right in the sense that Sorry, Jurgen Klopp has taken four years to get to work and Jurgen Klopp has got to. And that's not just been by doing everything in one window. Uh, the problem is, though, United are used to signing big players. United are used to challenging for titles. And right now, they're way off the pace. And you can understand the fans' frustrations. Look, Bruno Fernandes, get that deal over the line. We're struggling to get that deal over the line. Haaland, get that deal over the line. Didn't get that deal over the line. They do need big signings. Um, to work alongside what they've got. And I think they've got some good young players. And they've got the thing that fans are frustrated about, and we can all see, they've got glaring holes, not just in their squad, but in their starting eleven at the moment. You know, that's why there's such an onus to get a striker in. That's why there's so much an onus to get that Bruno Fernandes-type player in, if not him. That's, you know, and people are going, well, they didn't, you know, they didn't get Haaland. So who's the next cab off the rank? Who else are they interested in? It goes quiet. Who, if they didn't get Fernandes, who is it? It goes quiet, which always brings back to the fact that what is the structure at Man United when it comes to transfers? How is there not a list of players, right, we need a young player, who are the top three targets we're going to have in this position? That's what clubs have. Do Manchester United, because at the moment, it doesn't look like it. Well, it, it brings it back to Mark's point about experience. Now, United got a bit of criticism, didn't they, for missing out on Erling Haaland when he went to Dortmund instead. But what about if you look at it from another point of view, Manchester United bringing in another young player when their squad at this moment young players isn't really what they need. They need that experience. And, it, it, you know, if, if it was a, a conscious decision or not to not go through with the Haaland deal, we, we're not too sure. According to the agent, it was the player that chose, that chose Dortmund in that situation. But can United be criticised, therefore, for not taking the, the gamble on Haaland, if it can be considered a gamble, when actually it's experience that they should be looking at? I think this is the problem for Manchester United. And this would go to the board and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. What do you want Manchester United to be right now? Do you want them to be a side that is built on experience and talent and quality players that are all going to cost you between 50 and 100 million pounds each? Or do you want to build something for the future? Now, if Manchester United fans can accept that perhaps they won't challenge for the Premier League title this year, obviously, next year and possibly a third season, but you might be able to do it in four and five times, Time, are you going to accept not winning silverware for another three or four years to build a side that can potentially do that? Manchester United are one of the biggest clubs, not just in the Premier League, in world football. Every time they go to the negotiating table to try and sign a player, the price goes up by 25%. The expectation on the player goes up by 25% because they're going to Manchester United. And that's where there's a, a clever strategy that needs to be played by the board and the manager. What are we going to do? How are we going to play this? And that will then sort of simmer down to the fans and dampen potentially their expectations. And, but, and you say about what, when a player goes to negotiate with Manchester United, remember they're not in the Champions League. So straight away what they will want in terms of wages and incentives will go up. And the fact of the matter is just look at the Premier League table. Yes, Manchester United are fifth, six points off the Champions League. They're also four points, four points above the team in 14th. That's why there's an immediacy to get players in, but that's why also players are looking at Manchester United and going, well, if you want me to come, pay me. And how much does the manager influence that as well? We've seen players wanting to go to Inter Milan for the likes of Antonio Conte yeah, yeah. for that year. And obviously, Manchester United, you touched on it, will always have this year. It's one of the biggest clubs in the world. But players naturally are going to be thinking, I'm moving to play under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Is he the lure that the players want? Will, they, will they want to join the team? To add on to that point, and to add to what Mark said as well, yes, it's a rebuild job. How many players want to join a rebuild job? We're listening to Pogba right now. It looks like he wants to leave that rebuild job in the summer. Can May United still attract the players that we, well, they used to attract sort of four or five years ago? The Zlatans, the Falcals, the Di Marias, if it's going to be rebuild jobs for the next three or four seasons. It's the same Bruno Fernandes. There's a bit of a question mark over that. There was Paolo Dybala in the summer as well. That looked like a perfect fit. He essentially turned them down. Because uh, he wanted money, because he wanted to get paid because they weren't in the Champions League, because he has the same doubts that we all have around this table. <laughs> OK, loads of you getting in touch with us. Hashtag transfer talk. Uh, at Sky Sports News, Duncan says anyone who thinks it's a two to three windows before Man United are back is utterly deluded. He says Oli isn't coaching the team, no clear game plan, no methodology. Uh, while the Glazers are in and Oli is the manager, this will be 10 plus years or more before a title challenge is realistic. That's according to Duncan. Oli99 says Oli needs to get Bruno and an attacker, or I don't see him lasting long. Uh, Klopp had a CV, he won the Bundesliga, Oli got Cardiff relegated. Uh, Kyle says, uh, all about youth and the future at United. 
Yet Gomez and Chong are leaving on a free. I don't know where Tuan Zabi has gone. It's a joke at United from top to bottom. That is from Kyle uh, at Sky Sports News on Twitter. Hashtag transfer talk as well. Time for the state of play now with Mark. Too much negativity for a Friday. <laughs> Bournemouth are in talks with Spurs over a deal for Danny Rose. There are six Premier League clubs interested in signing him. Watford and Newcastle are also among those interested. Brighton have secured the permanent signing of midfielder Aaron Moy from Huddersfield Town. Moy has signed a three and a half year contract. Roma are interested in signing former Manchester United winger Adnan Yanazai. West Ham are in talks with Argentinian club River Plate over a deal to bring young defender Gonzalo Montiel to London. And finally, Sky Sports News has confirmed reports suggesting that Leicester City are interested in signing Southampton centre-back Yannick Vestergaard. Well, Mark mentioned him there, and next we are going to talk about Danny Rose and the future of the Tottenham defender. Will, be on, will he be on his way out this month?
Mikel Arteta has just held his pre-match news conference ahead of the FA Cup tie with Bournemouth. He has also discussed potential transfers, starting with reports linking Shakhtar Donetsk defender Mikola Matvienko with a possible move to the Emirates. Let's hear from him now. I don't know. I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be discussing uh, any transfer links uh, publicly. It's something that we are trying to do internally and uh, when we have news, we will communicate with you guys. Is it something you're still looking at, though, perhaps bringing in a defender on a more general basis? We've been looking at different positions. Obviously, since I joined, uh, we lost Callum um, and we had uh, other circumstances and injuries in those positions. So it's true that at the back we've been short. But uh, are other positions as well, depending what happens in the market, that we might need to assess. Are you hopeful something will be done before next Friday? Uh, at the moment, I am 50-50 because uh, this transfer is very, very complicated. I only want to bring somebody in if I'm really convinced that he can really uh, improve the level that we have. Um, Danny Ceballos um, apparently has been looking at the possibility of cutting his loan short and going back perhaps to, with the, to increase his chances of getting picked for Spain for the Euros. Has he indicated to you that he would like to perhaps move away to get more regular football? I had a conversation with Danny. Um, when I joined the club, he wasn't here. He was in Madrid because he was doing his rehab uh, for over a month uh, in Madrid, the, the team that um, owns him. And uh, then when I came here, he was doing his rear back the first two or three weeks. He was getting back to fitness. And I haven't seen much of him because he only trained with us a week or 10 days, you know. So it's very early to assess the, what I can do or cannot do with him. Um, I heard about all those things, but I have nothing to comment. Do you think if he's back at full fitness, would he be part of your plans? Should he, should he remain here? He needs to get back to fitness, fight for his place like any other team, and after that we will make the selection that I think is fair with what I see on the pitch. Um, and just, just one more transfer line, and I know you don't want to talk about specifics, but there's one that came out from Spain overnight about um, Aubameyang suggesting he had agreed a deal with Barcelona. Can you just clarify what the situation is with him and also with thoughts towards his contract in the future? As far as I know, I think a week ago after a game at home, we were discussing that he said he was so happy that uh, he didn't agree with the things that were writing in the media and he has his future here and I'm so happy with that. So that's where I'm standing at the moment. Very interesting comments there from Mikel Arteta, uh, not only on Matt Vienko, but also Danny Ceballos as well. And then finishing off with Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. So, Matt Vienko, what we know is that Shakhtar Donetsk want £30 million. Uh, he's a left-footed defender. The player's agent says the club are in talks over a deal for the 23-year-old. He's got 18 months left on his contract. So, Arsenal are looking to strengthen an area that we've been saying they needed to strengthen. I mean, the good thing about Matt Bianco is he can play left-back and centre-back and they've kind of got needs in both, really, haven't they? Because of the injuries at left-back to, well, to Kieran Tierney, he's out to probably till March, I think we found out earlier. So that's, that's not great for them. And obviously, we, we all know they're going to need a, a centre-back to get a little bit more experience in. But it's, you know, it's, again, you're kind of, we're talking about a defender, we're talking about Sabahis as a midfielder, mm. and we're talking about Aubameyang, his future with it, being a forward. Similar to Manchester United, there are holes in that team where you go, they could do improvement there could do with some improvement there and they could do with some improvement and it's you know it's a common theme with a, a former giant that's kind of struggling. We know that William Saliba though is obviously coming from St Etienne in summer and I think there'll be fans will be happy to see his arrival obviously that injury to Callum Chambers as well has been a huge blow for them um, this season but David Luiz he's looked rejuvenated under Arteta I think he had a really tricky start to the season and I think getting the sense from a lot of Arsenal fans that he's looking a lot better so um so there are some positive signs in defence as well for us. Yeah Darren has uh, helpfully tweeted in with a, with a whole list of players that he would sell mm -hmm. for <laughs> Arsenal, which include Socrates, uh, Mustafi and Kalasenak. It's not, it's not quite as easy as... Uh, it's not quite as easy as that, is it, to just sell players? Um, so, yeah, and, and obviously we've been talking about centre-backs there as well. David Luiz, um, rejuvenated, obviously, under Mikel Arteta. He, d he had that horrible moment, didn't he, the other night against, uh, against Chelsea when he got sent off as well. Um, but plenty of people getting in touch with us at Sky Sports News, hashtag transfer talk. And what we have been told uh, consistently in this transfer window 
is that Arsenal won't be making signings that require significant investment. They have committed to paying £150, £160 million pounds in fees which will start to kick in in the summer for next year's budget. So that is where we stand with Arsenal. Um, we're going to talk Newcastle, we're going to talk EFL, we're going to look at the Scottish Premiership a little bit later on in the programme as well. But let's turn our attention to Tottenham now and defender Danny Rose may be on the move with a week to go in this transfer window. But where might he end up? Alice, what do we know about his future? We brought the news this morning, didn't we, that Bournemouth were one of the six Premier League clubs interested in Danny Rose. Now, the update now is that they have actually, um, yeah, they are interested and they are now in talks for the left back. Now, Watford and Newcastle are two more of those six Premier League clubs interested. So, his future very much up in the air, 18 months left on his contract. But we were speaking about it yesterday, weren't we? He said months ago that he will be running down his contract he won't want to leave at the he won't want to leave until he comes towards the end of that and actually Daniel Levy and him have had conversations about that there's a lot of understanding there he though wants regular football he wants to get back in the England setup obviously the Euros just around the corner 29 caps for England we know that Gareth Southgate is a big admirer of him as well but it's kind of been a bit of a downhill spiral at Spurs hasn't it over the last year obviously we've seen the emergence of the likes of Ryan Sessignon and Jaffet Tanganga and they've both looked really good this season and they've been starting ahead of Rose at left back and Ben Davis he'll obviously be another option as well once he returns from that ankle injury and Jose Mourinho was just speaking yesterday about how much he admires him and that he will be playing ahead of Rose so under Jose Mourinho it looks like he's not going to be able to show Southgate that he's ready to be back in the England setup so yeah Bournemouth now um, now in for the, in for the player. I find that really odd though because when Jose Mourinho was in charge of Manchester United, when Danny Rose was arguably in the form of his career going into the World Cup back in the 17-18 season, Manchester United were interested. Jose Mourinho was interested in signing Danny Rose. And yet Danny Rose has only started, what, one Premier League game in the last two months, three months? Yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's an odd, odd situation that Danny Rose is in. Why would Bournemouth want Danny Rose then? Is that something that they're looking at in this window, that position? Uh, because he's a great player. You know, I think that's the bottom line. There are six Premier League sides interested in taking Danny Rose to them because he is quality. He has played at the very highest level. He had, it was a huge part of that successful Maurizio Pochettino um, five years at Spurs. And obviously he has played at the highest level with England as well. And Gareth Southgate clearly rates him very highly. Um, I think there's still a lot of football in Danny Rose left. He's still not 30, so he's still got time on his side. Um, and looking ahead to the Euros in the summer, he will be wanting to play regular first-team football in the Premier League. Otherwise, he won't be going to the Euros. And we know that Gareth Southgate wants to select those younger, ambitious, creative, fancy players, you know, the exciting talent of the future. Um, and, and Danny Rose certainly would, would be on the, the upper end of the, the age scale. In terms of going back to your point about Bournemouth, there are a lot of players that they'll be looking at over the course of this window. It is very difficult to sign players in this particular January, as we know. Um, they've had a couple of problems at left-back with, with injuries and things, so he would be a player that could fill in and obviously bring experience, and that's what Bournemouth need. They're in a relegation scrap. A player with that experience would be vital. I think he's something like the fourth longest-serving player in the Premier League. Uh, you look at Mark Noble, uh, Leighton Baines, David Silva, only ones that have been there a little bit longer in the Premier League. Now, Tottenham fans might want to get in touch about this. Hashtag Transfer Talk at Sky Sports News. Whoever, if somebody does end up signing Danny Rose in this window, are they getting, are they getting a Premier League legend? And if he's not in that bracket, why is he not in that bracket? Seeing as he's served Tottenham for such a long time. Um, legend might be stretching it just a tad. Um, you know, he's up there. He's, I mean, you reeled off the names that are, are above him in terms of appearances. Um, I don't know, he's fallen off a little bit in the last season or so. You, you talked about Jose Mourinho being interested in him when he was at Manchester United. That was, what, two seasons ago, I think there was talks about a possible move to United. There was talks about a possible move to Watford as well. He was there, really, wasn't he? He's ready to go. Um, look, I think he's a very good player. And I think anyone that gets him at 29... I think there's still four or five good seasons with him. There's not been many injuries. And um, I, I think he does need to move to force his way back into that England squad. Ben Chilwell's now in front of him. Um, but you can understand, if he does move to a club and does get regular football, you can see him ousting Ben Chilwell. I think he's still that good. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know about being a legend just yet. OK. Uh, well, it's a good Robert, shout, though, Dave. I'm not... Well, no, I mean, it's a good shout. Just want to do, just throw it out there. Just yeah, throw yeah, it out there sure. and people can agree or disagree. That's what it's about, this programme, so feel free. Um, so, Robin, the Newcastle fan, has got in touch with us and said, I think we need to look at a left-back. Dummett and Jetro out for the season. Yeah. Rose would be a brilliant option. 
Well, it just so happens another club interested in Danny Rose is Newcastle. Manager Steve Bruce has given a helpful count, hasn't he, over the last couple of weeks of the number of players Newcastle have been linked with. A couple of weeks ago it was 38. I think last <laughs> Friday it was 58. Keep going, it's getting, it's getting higher. <laughs> he's given, yeah, he's given us a brief answer today on their interest in Rose. Have a listen. It'd be wrong for me to sit and talk about other people's players, but look, he's a quality player and a class actor kid, so um, whether it's possible, who knows. That was very brief. Blink and you'll miss it. Doesn't like to talk about other players, but he's very good, essentially, from Steve Bruce there. And you look at what they need in this transfer window. Their injury problems, I mean, it's been well documented, hasn't it, at the moment for Newcastle? Yeah, I mean, we spoke earlier about Arsenal having holes everywhere, Manchester United having holes. I mean, they've got, they've got a big hole, uh, and it's every position for them right now. So many injuries as well, players out of form. Let me go through some of the injuries here we've got. And these are players that kind of play in those de defensive positions. Um, Emil Kraft, he's can play in both fullback positions. He's out for six weeks. Um, Florian Lejeune, who scored those two fantastic goals against Everton, injured himself in the overhead kick and the celebration. He's out as well. Um, we've got their Paul, Paul Dummett's out. Jetro Williams is out. Javier Manquillo is out. Jack Colback. So, so many defensive-minded players are out. So you can see how... Um, I'm sorry, you can see how Danny Rose could probably fit in with them just to cover those defensive positions, of anything. And Bruce actually said previously that they'd be looking to sign a, tri a striker and he actually admitted they'd had a couple of knockbacks looking to sign a striker. So you think, with all these injuries, is that still going to be the place that they're looking to strengthen? Club record signing Joe Ellington, he finally got off the mark with his first goal for the club. So hopefully he can continue to do the business for them as well. Miguel Almiron has looked really good recently um, for the club too. So... They, ha they have been looking for strikers, but defensively, they'll be needing reinforcements as well, won't they? OK, well, we did say for Tottenham fans to get in touch about Danny Rose. Paddy has. He says, uh, quite simply, Danny Rose is not a legend uh, as oh. a Spurs fan. So he's, he's made his mind up, but you can agree or disagree. It's no harsh. problem. Is that what we said? <laughs> it's no problem at all. Straight to the point. Um, so Newcastle have already signed Nabil Bentaleb. Valentino Lazaro is on time side as well to complete his move to Newcastle from Inter Milan. Inter Milan. Let's hear from Bruce on that potential new signing. Well, he's here. He's in the building, which is um, which is a good sign. I think it's fair to say that we've we've managed to hold off a couple of clubs, you know, because once he became available, then somebody of his pedigree was <clears throat> was always going to have a few options. <clears throat> and thankfully, he's chose us. So um, he's here. We hope that we can get the paperwork and everything done, so he can uh, he can play tomorrow. And it sounds as though um, teams who are Doing well in the respective leagues that you've fought off the competition from, so you must. Yeah, I mean, I listen, I'm not so sure of. I mean, there was big talk of Leipzig, of course, um, but I think the idea of coming here and playing in the Premier League is, as, uh, as when we, his agent was here last weekend, so we've had to be patient, but um, we're delighted he's here. Looks like that one is very close to being announced. It's going to be a loan with an option to buy for £20 million in the summer. I mean, we talked about injuries there, but is this, a, is this an optimistic time for Newcastle supporters, given what's going on on the pitch as well? I think you could argue, yeah, definitely, because Newcastle are three points better off than they were at this, this exact point last season. And where, yeah, they, fans must be asking, where would we be if we had all of our players fit? If we have the majority of our players fit? You know, it's a very much a question of what if. And I think it was hearing from Steve Bruce uh, after the game at Wolves the other week, and he was saying that, you know, we're not going to go big in January because actually I've got a good squad and a lot of them are coming back from, from muscle injuries in the next sort of four, five, six weeks. So I think he's eyeing up a really sort of, you know, he's optimistic about the end of the season, basically. He thinks he can go on a run between now and May and get them further up the league because it's so tight. They're 14th, but again, they're only, what, four points behind Manchester United? I remember, an, I'm, sorry. I was going to say, I remember back in summer when we announced the news that he was going to be taken over, and obviously the fans loved Rafael Benitez, or most of them did at the time, and I think it's fair to say that most Newcastle fans weren't fairly happy about the appointment of Steve Bruce back then, but actually he's coming and he's done a really, really good job, and it sounds like he's got quite a good relationship with owner Mike Ashley as well. He said they've held recent talks and have been very, very good, and he has got money to spend. So, actually, I think where they were back in summer, when Rafael Benitez left to move to China, where the fans are at now and where the club is at now, they've got to be fairly happy, you'd think. And on Steve Bruce, sorry, I was going to say, I think this is a dilemma that's facing a lot of Premier League managers at the moment when it comes to making signings in January. Yeah. They've got a lot of injuries, but those players come back from injury eventually, so you have that dilemma. Do you bring someone in, you sign a player, 
then you've got someone coming back from injury, so then you've got more unhappiness in the squad. So a lot of managers appear at the moment to just go, let's wait and see because we've got X, Y and Z coming back into the system and then that will alleviate these injury problems we've got at the moment. I guess yes. it depends how desperate you are as well. I mean, they, they were into double figures, their injuries recently, so it's what you need at the time as well just to get through the season. Yeah, still a week to go, obviously, in this transfer window. We've, we've opened the floodgates a little bit on the, on the Danny Rose <laughs> question that we posed. Uh, Dean has got in touch. Danny Rose may not be considered a legend as such, but a great servant to the game and to the league. Sam says, we sold Trippier after one poor season, ended up being a big mistake with no one to replace him. Selling Rose would be doing exactly the same. Might not be a legend, but a Premier League great for sure. I hope he's watching. Well, I hope so as well. <laughs> uh, next news from the EFL. We'll also bring you the thoughts from Inter Milan forward Romelu Lukaku. Find out why he decided to leave Manchester United.
there's a little bit that little uh, that bumper there. Anyway, let's take a look at what's going on around the EFL now. And West Brom have confirmed the loan extension of Grady Dion Garner until the end of the season. Hull City head coach Grant McCann insists the club hasn't received any firm bids for Jared Bowen. The forward has been scouted by multiple Premier League clubs after scoring 16 goals in the championship this season. Charlton, they're in talks with Peterborough over a deal for Marcus Madison. His contract is up in the summer. Nottingham Forest are interested in signing Burnley striker Naki Wells. Bristol City, though, are also after him, and they have Charlton's Lyle Taylor also on their list. And Fulham midfielder Matt Riley is in talks with Ghent. The England under-19 under international is a free agent at the end of the season. And one further line to bring you from the EFL was regards to Grady, the Angana, uh, West Bromwich Albion, have confirmed that uh, he will be staying with them, as Anton said, until the end of the season, just to bring some quotes from Slaven Bilic. Uh, he said, you don't often hear this from a manager as well. He said, I would be lying if I said I knew he would be this good. We didn't know, <laughs> but I didn't want him here just as a squad player or as a number. Uh, so Grady Diangana has been fantastic on a, during his loan spell at West Bromwich Albion. Five goals in 21 league appearances. Uh, and that is great news for West Bromwich Albion's promotion push to the Premier League. Now to our exclusive interview with Inter Milan forward Romelu Lukaku. It was quite a summer, wasn't it, for him being linked with moves away from Manchester United throughout the summer. He wanted to leave, ended up on the club's pre-season tour before finally making that move to Italy. He's been telling our reporter Paul Gilmore about when he made the decision and how the move came about. I made my decision around March and... and um... You know, I went to, to the manager's office and I told them that, you know, it was time for me to find something else because, um, you know, I wasn't performing, I wasn't playing. And, you know, I think a lot, a lot in that year happened that, you know, uh, it was, it, it, it was from bo for both sides, it was maybe better to, to, to go separate ways. And, you know, I think I made the, the right decision and I think, um, Man United now has discovered, um, you know, has made space for the younger players to come through. So I think it was a bit of a win-win situation for, for both of us. Interesting there, wasn't it, that uh, Lukaku said that the decision was made in March. That opens up even more questions, really, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. When, when did he tell the club? When did the club know that you know, they'd probably have to move on from Romelu Lukaku? And... How long have Manchester United had a need at striker? Was it going back to March? Which means they had even longer to plan to potentially bring in somebody in that number nine position. Yeah. And now we're still talking about it, aren't we? So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see you know, if they were told early, they've had two windows effectively now to find another striker. Yeah, you wonder if they probably looked at someone like a Mason Greenwood coming through and thought maybe they don't need to replace Lukaku, push uh, Rashford into that number nine positions, Marshall, Greenwood coming through. But yeah, I mean, United fans are not going to be happy hearing that. I mean, they've had now, like you say, two windows to try and find someone. It hasn't happened. And I mean, if they're upset before that, they're going to be even more upset listening to what Lukaku said there. I think it's easy also to remember what a player Lukaku is. I know, obviously, last season was probably one of his worst, actually, for Manchester United, but 113 Premier League goals, his 20 top scorers in the history of the competition, and that's just by the age of 26. So he was always going to be a huge loss. And back then, obviously, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said, we will look to replace him. And then as the emergence of Mason Greenwood came through and he started to perform really well, you heard Ollie say, well, I knew that I knew that Greenwood was always going to be up, up to the job and everything. But, yeah, they haven't replaced him. And he, saw, he still scored 50. 15 goals for them last season. Remember, in the Champions League, he scored those two goals against PSG to get them through to the quarterfinals as well in that dramatic comeback win. So he did provide some good moments for them last season, even though it wasn't great for him. And he's a prolific goal scorer. I mean, look at this season as well. He also said to Paul Gilmore in that interview that he, he thought he would have been more successful at Manchester United if Jose Mourinho had managed to get the signings in that he wanted to, which tells us a lot. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Manchester United um, had a manager in Mourinho who was a serial winner. Um, and whilst, you know, the style perhaps wasn't what Manchester United fans were used to, he was slowly building something. His philosophy generally has always been to sign experienced players that are proven at that level, are proven at playing in a first team and can do it now. Uh, and, and obviously Manchester United's philosophy, as we've seen, has slightly gone away from what perhaps Jose would have done. 
and there was links with some experienced Premier League players. I think Olderweireld was an interesting link as well, whilst Jose was at Manchester United. That deal never happened, but taking those types of players almost guarantees them a level of success at that particular moment, but the club seemed to be wanting to look one, two, three seasons ahead. With one week to go then until deadline day, many players up and down the country will be thinking about their futures. Plenty of time still for deals to get done, but there's only a week to go now. Lukaku says it can be a stressful time leading up to the deadline. The leading up to deadline day is, is the most stressful. Deadline day itself, if you know it's going to happen, is not really that stressful. It depends just where you want to go. That was for me the thing, like now, the, this time. That was for me really, I knew I was leaving, but it was where am I going to, you know? I could go to Turin or I could come here. I wanted to come here. So when my agent come, he called me and he said like, we're going to Milan tonight. I was like, yes, <laughs> you know? And then I was gone. Very happy Romelu Lukaku there. It seemed like we were talking about Lukaku for the whole summer, but the move was only confirmed on deadline day here in England. And I remember we had uh, the Belgian journalist Christophe Tereur on the Transfer Talk podcast and he was saying that Antonio Conte will be the perfect manager for Romelu Lukaku because I, th I feel like saying mechanical does meticulous. Conte... Me meticulous. meticulous. Mechanical does him a bit of a disservice, but he will tell Lukaku where he needs to be at yeah. what point every single time. Channel that energy. Yeah. Make sure it makes the right runs. And, more, and crucially as well, he's got someone with him and Lautaro, Lautaro Martinez up front with him. So he's got a partnership. They, you know, not just Conte in his ear, he's also got a fantastic little number 10 around him as well who can you know, create space for him, which is not really what he had at Manchester United because they play with the two wingers and one up front. So I think a criticism of, of um, Lukaku at Manchester United was you know, Solskjaer didn't know how to use him or he didn't fit into Solskjaer's system. Well, he's, now he's with a manager that absolutely adores him. Yeah, and... I mean, it, it could only get better, you would assume, for Romelu Lukaku if Inter Milan get the deal for uh, Christian Eriksen over the line as well. Which Nearly we went still... through a whole show without mentioning it. I know, sorry, <laughs> sorry everybody. I just had to mention Christian Eriksen there because we're still obviously waiting for that. Keep your tweets coming in, hashtag transfer talk. We are at Sky Sports News as well on Twitter. So make sure you stay with us because we're still going to hear from Stephen Gerrard here on Sky Sports News. He will be busy with a week to go. We'll also analyse who needs to do business before the window closes. That's next.
Hello, this is Transfer Talk on Sky Sports News. Loads of Manchester United fans are getting in touch. We heard from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer at the top of the show here. Uh, Azza has got in touch saying Manchester United need five signings. Please get Bruno and at least another two this window. As I says, the fans need this. Uh, Scott's got in touch saying it's time Manchester United got the players in. It's taken 20 days to sort one player uh, and I would be watching him to see what scouts say to get a deal done. There is other players which the clubs are linked with. Why not go and get them? Danny Rose, Christian Eriksen, Adnan Yanazai saying. Yeah, uh, so keep getting in touch. Hashtag transfer talk on Sky Sports News. Now, could Alfredo Morelos leave Rangers this month? We told you yesterday that Sevilla are keen to take the 28-goal striker to La Liga this month. Steven Gerrard has given an update on Rangers transfer dealings. In terms of being close, ins or outs, I'd say no. Um, I know there's a lot of speculation about some of our players at the moment, but we've had no bids. Um, we've had phone calls and this staff from all kinds of different agents about ins and outs, but there's nothing for me to report on in terms of being close in or out. Alfredo Morelos got linked with another club this week. Is it a case of, once again, reiterating not in this window or for the foreseeable? He's not for sale. Um, nothing's changed on that, but you know, when will I see it again? In two, three days, we'll speak about the different clubs, so it's just one of them things. Yes, Gerard has also been talking about Jermaine Defoe today and says he expects a de decision on his future in the next day or two. Defoe's on loan at Rangers until the end of the season when his contract at parent club Bournemouth expires. He's been linked with a player-coach role in Glasgow. There'll be some news in the next day or two. Good news for Rangers fans? I hope so. How, how important has he been? And if it is the good news that we all expect, how big of a move would that be for for you and to keep him at the club? Massive, massive. Um, he's so important to, to the team and the squad. He's so important to the club because the way he behaves on and off the pitch. Typical default goal uh, the other night where he's in the right place at the right time and, and, and gets, you know, he's the quickest to react. And that's not luck or fluke. He's been doing that over the past couple of decades. I think he's absolutely fantastic for the likes of Joe and, and Glenn Kamara, the younger lads in the group, someone to aspire to and look up to. And um, he plays a pivotal part on and off the pitch, so um, it's massive. And um, I'm so happy that in a couple of days or a day or two, we'll get some good news on that. Yeah, Rangers fans, then make sure you uh, you keep tuning in to Sky Sports News. We will hopefully have some news on that, as Stephen Gerrard said, in the next day or two. Bournemouth now, manager Eddie Howe is usually very tight lipped on his transfer dealings, but with a lengthy injury list, they could be looking for incomings. Throughout January, we're actively looking, but um, so far it's been a very difficult window to find players that are available um, of sufficient quality to make our squad better. Um, but that means that doesn't mean that we won't stop looking until uh, the window closes. Um, has there been any further movement on the the winger from uh, Dortmund, Jakob Brun Larsen, at all? No, uh, no news to give you on any. Incomings or outgoings. And Bertrand Traore? Same. Nothing. And have you received any offers at all from no. any, any players? And na nothing on Nathan Aki? No. There was a report this morning that Bournemouth might be interested in, in Danny Rose. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Absolutely nothing to tell you on any incomings, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we tried. Yeah, at least we tried. Trying. Keep trying. What we do know is that Bournemouth are in talks for Danny Rose at this point in the day. Where are Bournemouth looking to strengthen, though, in this window? I think it's safe to say that any club in the bottom three in the Premier League in January will be looking at every position. How can they strengthen? What player can they sign? It might even just be one player that brings that little bit of magic that just scores a goal, keeps a clean sheet just spark some sort of a performance that says to the rest of the side and the fans, we're going to stay in the Premier League and we're up for the fight. Um, I think, you know, obviously you look at the, the situation with them before they play Brighton, they'd only scored one goal in six. Now, do you point to the strikers? Do you point to the, the creative midfielders? Do you point to the wingers? So I think it's fair to say that Bournemouth have looked all over the pitch at where they can make acquisitions. But we know this is a really tough window to make signings. I know that Eddie Howard said publicly as well, he's looking more so at loans than permanent deals. But the fact that they're being linked with two or three players in the window is a good thing. OK. Um... What we, what we do know is that there is a week to go for these teams to make these new signings. So, with one week left in this transfer window, 
Who needs to do what? Who will be happy? Who will be a little bit unhappy with seven days left in the transfer window? Who wants to kick us off then? Who's going to be... Who's, who needs to do a lot of work in the next seven days? Loads of teams, I think, but um, Tottenham, I think, needs to do work. Uh, they're not too far out of the top four, so they still have those Champions League aspirations. But with Harry Kane now injured, you wonder who's going to get the goals. Who's going to be the guy that puts the ball in the back of the net? I think Son's going to do a good job for them. So is Lucas Moura. They were linked with Piantec. We spoke about him on this show. Maybe a loan deal from AC Milan. That hasn't happened. They got Jetson Fernandes, which I thought was important. But they look like they might lose Christian Eriksen. So there's going to be holes in that Tottenham team. And you talk about losing Christian Eriksen, you lose a creative midfielder. They've lost their top striker. They need to do some business. And I think they probably won't. Ooh, be cool. OK. Big shout. Cool. Big shout. I'm, I'm shouting it. Big shout. What about striker coming in? What about Chelsea? I mean, they're, they're obviously after a forward player. Frank Lampard has made it very clear over, over this transfer window that they need a striker. Maybe it'll depend on the future of Olivier Giroud. And Mark, obviously, there's teams, as you mentioned, around the bottom three that will be, will be looking to strengthen. One team that perhaps has moved away from that bottom three is Southampton. And they've done fantastically well. So will they be pretty happy with their lot? Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. This is how the form of a team will transform the way a club approaches a transfer window. Ralph Hasenhutl was really vocal about the players he wanted to bring in in January. He said he wanted a minimum of two players, both of those being fullbacks. And he was quite open in press conferences to say that he was looking at players and looking to recruit. Now it's my understanding that they don't want to sign players. He's really happy with the transformation. They've gone from the bottom three in the Premier League to the top nine the top ten. Uh, so they are in ninth at the moment. They are doing really well. The group is clearly together. They are clearly believing in what the manager is doing. And he's really reluctant to start bringing in new faces because, as we know, any new face into a dressing room disrupts things. Yeah. Most of the time it can be positive, but occasionally if you chuck a player into an environment that's really good, the players are close-knit, they're playing well, they understand each other, the responsibilities of the team, are all, you know, they're all aware of their responsibilities, then actually bringing in a player can perhaps disrupt things. And when they've had the upward traje trajectory that they've had, why would you want to disrupt that? Yeah, I completely agree. I think the interesting thing about Southampton, I think, is the fact that you've got a manager in Ralph Hasenhutl, who, Hasenhutl even, it's been a long week, um, <laughs> Hard to who, say. who would love to develop a team in his own image. But you look at the players that they've, you know, they've signed under previous regimes that they've got out on loan, for example, big earners, Guido Carrillo, um, Fraser Forster, Mario Lamina, and that's just three. Wesley Holt's another one. You know, that's, they've got some big restrictions on, the, on what they can do in the market. So it'd be interesting to see once they get those off you know, the wage bill, what Ralph Hasselhoff... I can't say his name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not say well, the It's in the head now. But I, I will say one club I expect to be busy next week is Wolves. Yeah. I think, they'll, I think they'll sign at least two players next week. We know they're trying to sign Daniel Fidenz from Olympiacos, who's an exciting winger. That could cost in excess of £20 million. And they're going to try to bring in Nelson Oliveira as well. So, yeah, I expect Wolves to spend big next week. Now, we didn't have quite enough time to get through your whole story about Jack Wilshire earlier oh, on yeah. Good Morning Transfers. So you've got 40 seconds, Mark. <laughs> Take it away, your best deadline day moment. I've had a lot of deadline day moments that I love, but the Jack Wilshire story is always one that stands out in my mind. Um, I was down on the South Coast. It was one of Bournemouth's first deadline days in the Premier League, and there was a link with Jack Wilshire. And it was one of those that we thought it might happen then, it might not happen then, it might happen. And then we got the phone call. He's on his way down. Then we got another phone call that a certain Mr David Beckham had phoned Jack Wilshire to speak to him and try and convince him not to join Bournemouth, but to join AC Milan, who, of course, David Beckham had just finished playing with. So it's a fascinating story. The bottom line is he joined Bournemouth. Yeah, you and go. David Beckham didn't quite get his wish. Who would turn down David Beckham, clearly? <laughs> Jack, Jack Wilshire. Uh, thank you very much to everybody here. Transfer Talk podcast is going to be out later tonight, so make sure you download that from all the usual places. Good Morning Transfers returns for you on Monday at 9am. Transfer Talk, we're also back Monday, that is from midday. And Dom Chef and Carve Solicole return with the transfer show that continues at 7 pm this evening. Still to come here on Sky Sports News, we're going to keep you right up to date with the cricket as England go for victory against South Africa. Plenty more transfer news to come. Loads of managers here, so don't go anywhere.